All right, we're gonna continue chapter four while I took that little break. This is chapter four, continued on in Strength for Parents of Missing Children by me, Marie White. And we're on the section called, What We Do Matters. Some things stay with you forever. Years ago, I read an article about a couple who had fasted at lunch every Thursday to pray for their children. I thought this was a good idea, but never imagined that I could do it. In the middle of our child being gone, I found that fasting no longer sounded so impossibly hard. I chose Wednesday at lunch and committed to fasting and praying for my family each Wednesday for the rest of my life. When the disciples had a demon they could not cast out, Jesus said it was because the disciples hadn't fasted and prayed. Since they had not fasted, their prayers were not powerful enough, so Jesus had to cast the demon out for them. Prayer alone had not broken the evil strongholds that kept our child from coming home. I needed to do something powerful. I decided to start fasting during lunch once a week. Praying and fasting for our missing child, as well as each member of our family, was both the least and the most I could do. Fasting is another tool that you can use to fight for your missing child. Ravi Zacharias tells the story of a young soldier who was in battle. This man worked as a medic. One day, his commanding officer told him to run into the battlefield and pull the wounded men to safety. The battle was thick. There were bullets flying, and the young man kept looking down at his watch. Then he would look out at the battlefield and hesitate. Over and over, he looked out, then looked down at his watch. His commander yelled again for him to get into the battlefield. Finally, the young man looked at his watch once more and ran to pull others to safety. Later, his commander confronted him. Why did he take so long to obey the command? The young man stated, sorry, I think I'm just gonna cry this whole book. So let's just, I'll just take all the makeup off and we'll just cry the whole book. So why did he take so long to obey the command? The young man stated that though he was not a Christian, his mother was. Before he left, she told him that every day at a particular time, she would be praying for him. And he decided he was not going into battle until he knew that she was praying. What we do matters. The simple prayers of a person's heart can have a profound effect on many lives. Can you imagine sending your children into the world with the knowledge that each week you were fasting and praying for them? That would be a lasting legacy. It would connect you across the miles. Imagine it, just you and God talking about the kids. Would you like to join me on Wednesdays? Do our prayers really achieve anything? Do they actually affect the outcome? The Bible says that they do. James 5.16 says, The prayer from the heart of a man right with God has much power. The verses below tell of a time when God was looking for someone who would stand in the gap before him so that he might not destroy the city but he found no one. So he poured out judgment. God was willing to forgive, but in an entire city, there was not even one person who would pray for that city because there was no one who would pray. The city was destroyed. Ezekiel 22, 29 through 31. The people of the land have practiced extortion and committed robbery. They have oppressed the poor and needy and unlawfully exploited the foreign resident. I had searched for a man among them who would repair the wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land so that I might not destroy it, but I found no one. So I have poured out my indignation on them and consumed them with the fire of my fury. I have brought their actions down on their own heads. In Matthew 7, 7 through 8, Jesus said, that we are supposed to keep asking and it will be given you. Keep searching and you will find. Keep knocking and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives. 
and he who searches finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Look online or in your Bible and find the rest of that paragraph through verse 12. Verses 9 through 12 explain how God feels about us asking him for things. C.S. Lewis said, In every action, just as in every prayer, you are trying to bring about a certain result, and this result must be good or bad. Why? Why then do people not argue as the opponents of prayer argue and say that if we intended good if the intended result is good, God will bring it to pass without your interference, and that it, if it is bad, he will prevent it from happening whatever you do. Why wash your hands? If God intends them to be clean, then they'll be clean without your watching them. Why do anything? We know that we can act and that our actions produce results. You cannot be sure of a good harvest, whatever you do to a field. But you can be sure that if you pull one weed, that one weed will no longer be there. Prayers are not always in the crude factual sense of the word granted. This is not because prayer is a weaker kind of causality, but because it is a stronger kind. When it works at all, it works unlimited by space and time. That is why God has retained discretionary power of granting or refusing it. We do not always see the immediate results of our prayers. However, we should know that they are doing something in a realm far beyond our ability to comprehend and are more powerful than we know. <clears throat> in James McDonald's book, When Life is Hard, he writes about suffering through his son's horrible accident, his church caving in and getting cancer all at once. Millions of dollars in liens were placed on the stalled project and dark clouds of bankruptcy loomed large over the entire ministry. Construction committee members resigned en masse. Night after night, I walked alone through the incomplete worship facility. It felt more like a tomb than a church. And as I walked, I wondered how it had all come to this and what God's possible purpose could be in making life so hard. In the midst of all that James went through, he wrote several books and produced incredible resources for other who others who experienced hard times. Beth Moore writes, the richest testimonies come from people he has made whole and who still remember what it was like to be broken. One of the rewards of going through something hard is that it earns you the right to speak about God's goodness. For someone to hear that God is good, even when they see you suffering, speaks volumes. If you can still trust God when it looks like he has abandoned you, then you must know something about God that they don't. And we do. We know that God has used a thousand hard times and terrible people to bring about his good plans. In fact, it's during hard times that people often feel closest to God. One of the most famous Christian books of all time is Pilgrim's Progress, written in 1678 by John Bunyan. It was written while Bunyan was in prison. The reason he was in jail was that he was a Baptist preacher at a time when the Church of England was the only church allowed. Bunyan's wife died. His daughter was blind. And he was in prison. You would think that with all of the bad things that had happened to him, he would have been bitter with God. Instead, he wrote the most beautiful story about a man who has to go through life's trials to get to heaven. Bunyan takes each season of our lives and gives it a name and a place. As you read it, your soul begins to heal, and you realize that all of us have to walk through troubles. His book is still a bestseller, which almost every Christian has read and found comfort in. Thoughts and Prayer the paradox of grief is that it is healing. It somehow restores our soul. And when in the while we thought it would leave us in despair. No, I read that wrong. Then all the while we thought it would be, I'm still getting that wrong. Apparently I can't read. I wanna read that again. So I don't have to cut this and fix it. 
The paradox of grief is that it is healing. It somehow restores our souls when all the while we thought it would lead, leave us in despair. And that's by John Eldridge. 2 Corinthians 1, 8-10 says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the trouble we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. Philippians 4, 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And Romans 5, 3 through 5 says, we also glory in our suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Joy and pain together baffle me. How can we have joy during this heart-wrenching time? Some of us have it. We can also say thank you to God because we know him. It would be similar to a prisoner of war undergoing brainwashing as the captors say, you have no country. No one cares about you. You don't have anyone who wants your return. And how the prisoner would combat that barrage of statements meant to make them forget their homeland they would do it by recalling memories of riding the bike, their bike through a countryside, drinking a soda with friends, going to prom. They would combat the lies with memories of the truth. It's the same with God. When you look around you and can only see pain and sadness, search your memories and remember when he has proven himself faithful to you. Faith thanks God in the middle of the story. And Boss Carol. God is always up to something. I've asked him what I'm supposed to do. I felt like his answer was, go through this. To which my heart screams, it's too hard. Second Chronicles 16, 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. God wants to show himself strong, and he's happy to do so through people who are willing to let him have his way. Luke 12, 11 through 12 says, When you are brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. Everything in the Bible says not to worry or fear. It also says that if you're a Christian, this is his battle, and he already has the victory planned. We're to be still. It's still unbelievably hard. While we're looking at our empty arms, it's easy to forget the good things in our lives. We may start to wonder if there are any good things. Write down anything for which you're thankful. If you need help, start with the most basic things and continue until you can't write anymore. Use paper if you have to finish the list. Mine would start with a home to live in, food to eat, the privilege to be a parent when others never get that opportunity, even for a short time, a family who loves me, friends, money to pay the bills, hope. When you thank God and praise him in the middle of your hardship, you're actually presenting an offering to God. Your thank offering is worth more to him than time or money. One of the most precious gifts you can give to God is a thankful heart and trust in him, especially when you don't understand what he's doing. Listen to this talk at mariewhiteauthor.com under the Strength for Parents tab on book link six. It's by Greg Laurie as he walks you through this process. He says that going through hardship 
earns you the right to speak. And we know that all things work together for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28.